All right. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here with me. I hope everyone has really enjoyed our um, our five, four, five, yes, five part series, man. What a process this has been. We had such a great time uh, at the Saskatoon Equine Expo. It was just an amazing thing. Um, and uh, it really is great when it asks you to build your presentation in a specific way where you can take people step by step through your process and the way you look at horses. So I really hope that was really helpful to you. Um, it was uh, just great. We've already gotten a lot of great feedback. Um, so I think we will get started. Um, just continuing to check people. So if, if, uh, if it feels like it's asking you to wait, it's just a matter of me having to check you in um, as a, I guess a precautionary element. So. All right, so the first question that I have received is, um, what do you mean by when you say a horse coming over their back? All right, so that it's kind of a funny thing and we've been really working at this. Everybody kind of has their own lingo and you find that you just say things because it's what you say and you're used to it and you know what it means. And then you say that in a new realm and you have to explain that. So. Uh, I think there's lots of little words like that. So I, what I'm, the reason I'm saying this is I just don't want anyone to feel any, any anxiety of if I say a word and you're kind of like, what the heck does he mean? I totally get that that thing is kind of hanging in the air. So if you feel like you want to ask me what might, you might think, well, it's kind of a silly question. There is no silly questions. There are only silly answers. So I just want to preface with that. So when we're talking about horses coming over their back, when you're watching the progression of the series that we put together, I talked a lot more about that when I was dealing with crews, when in the third demo. So when we're referencing that, we'll be speaking more specifically to that demo, but everything I built built up to that. So a horse coming over their back is when the back is, is relaxed. There's no tension in the back and the horse is able to extend their neck. So we talk a lot about horses coming softly to our hands. And that means the horse cannot be, there can be no weight in your reins. The way I build my progression, we talk a lot about a horse bending laterally first. So there was a progression that we discussed where the shoulders had to move, the rotation of the pole would happen, the horse would step under, and then they could push forward and lengthen. So for a horse to come over their back, the reins can't be heavy, and the horse has to be releasing their back all the way to their hindquarters. And what that will look like is it'll almost look like a horse's, they call it telescoping the neck. It looks like they're really reaching towards the bridle. The head will be a little bit more elevated and the back will be very long. The, the process of this is pretty much what we've done. So the referencing of this question can be seen through the whole progression of, um, of these, this series. So that was great. Um, okay, so just a couple little questions. People are just asking a couple, um, questions regarding uh, their audio. So if you have any audio issues or video issues, if you look down into the bottom left-hand corner, uh, you can see that you can change, there should be a mute button and a video button, and that would allow you to join if that's off on your settings. Okay, all right, so Tamara, hi Tamara, says, while I recognize that the type of bit is not what's most important here, I was wondering if you would share what kind of bit you were using on the Andalusian in today's demo, as well as a progression of what bridle bits you use in his training to this point and why. Um, what helps you decide it, it in time for the next bridle or bit for a horse in training? Wow, this is great. And how much does this vary from horse to horse in program? Such a great question. Some of you know that I take my horses through the hackamore. So in the video, in the videos, you saw that I had Bentley in the hackamore. And I also alluded to the spade. We never actually got to it, but I alluded to that. So the hackamore is a great piece of equipment because what it does is it allows you to really help a horse understand how to use their body with nothing in their mouth. Some horses, when you put a, a bit in their mouth, they really struggle with it. And that is not, and even in this style, when we don't want to pull on the reins, you want to really be very gentle, they still just don't like something in their mouth. The hackamore also plays a really good role when a horse is young because they're still developing their teeth and there's still a lot going on in their mouth. So it's kind of a soft way of, of allowing them to develop their mouth and allow us to still have good conversations in the training. In Cruz's perspective, what I did is I actually started him in a snaffle and I was using the snaffle for quite some time with him. Um, and I got to a certain point. So, so when we're making changes in bits or you're gonna be moving from one bit to the other, um, 
I am always asking myself two questions. In general, I usually will start with a snaffle. I have um, two piece snaffles and three piece that I will use. Uh, and really there's so many varied ideas about it, but really I'm wanting to see when I put something into a horse's mouth, how do they feel? Are, are, they, are they happy with it? Do they mouth it a lot? Or is there kind of a softness in how they're accepting it? But with Cruz, it was a two piece snaffle and uh, I kind of have a modified D-ring that I use. I, I don't really like a loose ring snaffle because I find that uh, that can create a little bit of a pinch point in the corner of the mouth. So I tend to like kind of a modified D where it has a machined edge so there's no pinch points in the corner. I've had a lot of success with those. Now the nice thing about uh, just a regular snaffle is that the snaffle really helps you work with a lot of your laterality. It's not really as a uh, it's, it's a very simple bit. You can use it in various positions with your hands and, and you can get a lot done. So I did that with Cruz for a while, but he got to a place where he felt like he was kind of plateauing in how much he was able to release for me. So I moved to that bit that I was using there. It's just, a, it's just like a single bit, a single piece bit. So there's, it's a fixed mouthpiece with a fixed um, um, shank. You know what it was? I, I don't know. It was, I don't remember the axle dimension, but it might be a three inch purchase on that. Um, and yeah, that's, that was the bit. And when I, the thing is, I didn't really know what I was going to do. And some people say, well, it's a fixed bit. It's like, oh, that might, might be a bit big. But again, I put it on him. I was just trying. I wanted to start trying something. And when I put that on him, he just loved it. Is He was quieter in his mouth and the feel was very light that was there. So that became his bit. And I tried a few in the process. I actually have a one-to-one -one that I've used in the past where it has, it's the same height as it is drop on the bit. And it is a three-piece mouth, and he didn't like it at all. So off we went with that one. So, so my, my deal with bidding, predominantly I'm going to start with something very simple. And as we move along, I want to get to a place where I'm then, as we're advancing, I want to get to a place where I can have a little bit more feel in my hand, but not for the purpose of control. I want to have it for the purpose of a delicate sensitivity. So when you change your bit, it should be that you can do a little, and it's allowing you to receive more but not because you're trying to control a horse. So it's about delicacy and refined feeling. Again, that's really what you're trying to heighten. Perfect, that's a really great question. Okay, so I hope Anne's audio was fixed. Jody says, hi Jody. Jody says, Josh, could you explain more about what you had Dana do with her seat and legs when moving the shoulders? I'm super interested in how our shoulders figure into this. I'm interested in how our shoulders figure into this. And to Tamara's question, um, you had Bentley in the Hackamore. Yes, I did. So Bentley, obviously, that, that was kind of where I alluded to the Hackamore question. All right. Regarding shoulders, the, the first thing that I was, okay, so let's just explain what I was doing with Dana. What I was trying to get her to do, what was happening is, is that um, Dana was struggling because the mare would do things and then she would want to fix it. And I see this so commonly. People think that when the horse does something with their head and neck, we need to fix put their head back into position. And this is the first thing I remove. So a lot of times I'll actually take people's reins away for this very reason. It's absolutely imperative that we recognize we don't pull on our horses. It's pretty important. Now, if you start to recognize what a horse is doing when they are moving their head like that, they're actually using their head as a cantilever. So what they'll do is they'll position their shoulder and then they'll push their head. So to push their head, they actually have to get their balance first and then throw their head. So if they're gonna throw their head to the right or push to the right, they actually have to lean their shoulder left. Now, if a person's gonna pull on their left rein, they actually have to lean into that to, to, to create um, the strength to pull against the rein. All right, so, so what I want to do in that is I wanna recognize first that your horse is actually gonna follow your weight. And this is a bit of a complex scenario, but I'm gonna talk about this generically or generally by the horse's shoulders and our position. So what I want to do in the beginning is recognize if you can shift your weight slightly to the outside, slightly to the inside, your horse has to move underneath you to support your balance. To get a horse to bend correctly in the beginning, what we're trying to do is we want to try to feel all the way from the horse's head all the way to their tail. So in general, what we're looking for is I want to see that the horse can shift the weight slightly to the outside. And when their weight shifts slightly to the outside, their head will tip slightly to the inside. And what this does, is this actually starts to create bend entirely by what you're doing with your seat. And this is beautifully complementary to what we discussed in the groundwork. If you remember when I was working Cruz and I found his balance, and then what I did is I 
I would actually turn him loose at liberty and you could see that he could carry that balance because it's actually quite easy for them to carry their head and neck when their balance and the shoulder is correct. Right, so then what I was doing is I wanted her to recognize when she shifted her seat and applied her leg that she could actually find bend in the reins and almost receive the bend in the reins, but not having to kind of make it happen with the hands. So when you relinquish the reins and you start recognizing that you can move your seat and feel the horse, it starts to create a different form of connection. So my encouragement to everyone is, is when you're riding your horses, just relax on your reins for a sec and just start shifting your seat around. I believe great posture doesn't come by someone telling you how to sit, but I find that it's much better when you discover how to sit. So sit on your horse and sit as straight as you possibly can. Don't worry where they go for a minute and just shift your weight a little. See what the horse does. Watch what their head does. If you shift enough, you will get a change of direction. If you shift too much, the horse will stiffen and brace against you. So this will be great feedback for you in the process of trying to figure out where straight is, okay, and where that center is, where is that feely point when you're connected with your horse, which will allow you to get to a place where you can direct the shoulders and then start shaping the horse with your hands. So the hands are a big part, the seat's a big part, but to direct our horses in the beginning, I want you to relax everything and just play with it, feel it. Feel where that spot is where you can find that connection. Hopefully that makes sense, Jody. It's a really fun exercise actually because it takes a little bit of pressure off you. And then slowly you pick your reins up and then see if you can feel the weight shift in. And if it hits the rein, you shift your seat. If it hits the rein, you shift your seat until your seat actually is the thing that softens your reins. All right, good stuff. All right, Anne, uh, hi Anne, asks a question. I know I use my reins and lead too often to control and have been working on that. I played with my horses a bit today on the halter, asking for softness with the lead. Um, and then in brackets, there is sometimes a lag time, but they, they seem to understand. But when I ask for the shoulder, I definitely feel or see the tension and my automatic reaction is to do something, in, uh, do something to make them move. I feel like they are so used to me doing that, that when I ask with my energy, they don't even respond. Is that, something that, uh, is that sometimes the case or just takes time for me to get it right and then to understand? I hope that makes sense. That's a great question. And this, this does play in a little bit to what I was doing with Jackie in her lesson. So we'll just re-clarify some of that. But yes, the first thing, if we understand, and you can see, so I would reference the second lecture and I would also reference Jackie's lesson. So in the second lecture, we talked about what happens when a horse stiffens. So if they tighten, it actually drops more weight on the shoulders. I talked about the biology of that in the lecture. But what also happens is, is when the horse stiffens against the rein, um, they will go down more weight on the shoulders and they'll lean one way or the other. Now, if they're expecting us to connect with the rein, they'll usually lean into us. And that was what was happening with Jackie. So the first thing I encourage is, is just to release. So, so yes, ask them to soften, look for a feel, very important. But then what I encourage is, is start to engage yourself energetically more with the horses. Now, that was what I was trying to do with Jackie when I worked the mare. So what I did is the mare actually stepped right in. If you watch this again, you can see the mare step directly into me. And instead of me making a big fuss about it, what I did is I just tried to hold my space. She actually leaned into my rein, my hand, and then I just stayed consistent, not trying to fight with her, but stayed consistent until it became uncomfortable for her to lean in and against me. Most of the time what people do is when the horse leans in, we actually back away, okay? And that becomes a major issue. And it's not a dominance, it's not a disrespect. Your horse and you are always just trying to sort it out. So if you're always just giving up your space, your horse says, okay, I guess I'm taking care of things because they just don't sense that you have the same level of confidence or clarity in your own ability. So it's not about leadership or dominance, it's just about what they feel from you. All right, so that's that piece. And now the second piece is, is that we, we have to just get to a place where we start more often trying to think about giving our questions energetically, moving in the space with a little bit more presentation and sense so the horse can feel your thoughts before you actually use a pressure. So in this, what I often will do is I'll just kind of raise my hand and I'll step in towards them and I'll just keep a feel there until they step away. And then I'll step in again and I'll hold that question and I'll wait until they step away. So I'm not sending or pushing or chasing, but I am creating clarity in what I'm saying. And this really starts to set a tone where it's a non-confrontational question to the nose, neck, and shoulders. So my one hand will direct, address the nose, 
Once the nose starts to move, my other hand will start to address the shoulder. So first you ask them to soften, then you start to activate your own space, ask the horse a question and wait until they make a change and then soften again. Once this standard starts to change and they start to recognize it's not an argument that they have to defend themselves with, we start to get a better change. Hopefully that makes sense and we do have more reference of that on the website for sure. Okay, good deal. Okay, hands good, that's great. Jody, that made sense, great. Okay, Valerie, hi Valerie. Valerie says, um, we discussed about bits and bridles. Do you have the same choice regarding the saddle? My horse is always looking at me with big eyes, kind of scared ones when I come with the saddle. He has a really good dressage uh, level, but um, also a lot of scars on his body. So I work, um, oh, sorry, I work in Liberty in long reins at the moment and he's really happy that way. What is your advice on this and how do you manage a horse? Uh, how do you manage those uh, horses with the work? Oh, okay, all right, so I think the question specifically is, you have a horse that it, when you bring the saddle, you can sense that there's anxiety in this. This is really, really important stuff because it isn't much different to us. So this isn't actually a saddle issue. It's more of a concept issue. And I'm gonna start with an example. So if you bring a baseball bat into a group of kids, you're gonna have some kids that are immediately gonna get excited. And then you might have one or two that are actually a little bit hesitant. And so what happens is it's actually not really the thing but it's what it meant and the experience that they had with that. Now what happens with horses, and this is a bit of a training thing, this is relational horsemanship at its core, is I'm not just going to put a thing on the horse and hope they figure it out. I'm actually gonna help them understand the essence of it, and then we will bring it to them. Some of you say, what the heck do you mean by that? Well, this is in general a pressure concept. When a pressure was brought to the horse, did they understand it? Were they able to control it in a yielding and thoughtful way? Or did they just have to have it put on them? And a lot of times this is the problem. We bring something to them and they kind of have to figure it out. This plays more into kind of the sacking out tendency where we talk about sacking the horse out. My idea is that what I want to do is I actually want to bring a pressure to the horse. I want to ask them to soften and then I take the thing away when they relax or when they soften to the line. So on one hand, I want to know now I recognize guys, I'm not trying to force them to soften because you can't, I can't force anybody to trust me, force anybody to like me or want to do anything I say. So forcing a horse actually gets you nowhere. They'll actually leave you more when the chips are down. So recognize when I say that I want the horse to soften, I'm not saying I want them to give in. I want them to let go of their anxiety. So what I want you to do first, Valerie, with this question is I want you to, to just take some kind of a, well, first off, start with the question is when you connect with the lead rope, just on a halter and you ask them to, to, to soften and relax, will they do that? If they will not do that, then that is number one. That has to be there first, all right? Secondly, bring a question that the horse, you know, might be a little bit unsure of, but not the, the degree as the saddle, and just bring it into their presence, ask them to soften, and then take it away when they soften. What happens here is the horses start to learn that they can actually control the pressure, which is their most important concern. Horses want to know that they can control pressure. What you release on is how they learn that. So if I take it away when they soften, pretty soon they start recognizing, man, they have a, an opinion in this that matters, and that is the key. So you bring the pressure in, you ask them to soften and take it away. Pretty soon they don't care because they know if they needed to, they would remove it, or they could have a say in it that wasn't about holding or running. Then you bring your saddle back into the scenario. Especially with an English saddle, this is much easier than a Western saddle. So you bring the saddle in, ask them to soften, take it away. Once you've built that base, there's way more understanding on the horse. So they'll actually play into this quite quickly. Then you bring the saddle in, ask them to soften, take it away. And you just go like that and you listen to the horse. Watch when you start getting closer. There's gonna be a point where all of a sudden the horse is holding tension. Now you've gone too far. So just retract a little bit, ask them to soften, take it away again. Pretty soon the horse will understand that they can interact with the saddle in a soft way and they can actually begin thinking from you that it isn't worrisome anymore because they're not just being victimized by the pressure, which is really a horse's biggest problem or biggest fear. They don't want to be victimized. They want to be involved in a conversation and understand how to control it in a thoughtful way. So really that's a great question. It has to do specifically with pressure. I have another YouTube video that you can reference on this when I was talking with the horse, the little mare that was herd bound. And that really is the biggest thing. 
what this horse is doing when she feels pressure is she's wanting to run away mentally. Okay, so the idea is, is can we get them to understand that when you apply a pressure, committing to you and softening actually deals with the pressure instead of holding it inside and wanting to run away. So by changing the horse's philosophy and you do that through yield, you start to be able to build a new box for them. Hopefully that makes sense. That's a great question because it really speaks to a whole bunch of pieces inside the training. All right, okay, I keep going here. So Deanna has asked, hi Deanna, asked, question is about our colt and how to start working with him. I'm pretty sure he is a space horse and he seems to want to, to be engaged and is super brave and curious, that's great. However, he wants to bite. Usually brave and curious will come with biting with a baby. Um, excuse me, so however, he wants to bite and if I try to get him to back a step up like you showed me, he is now too big and even if he does take a step back, then he is right back to biting me again. Oh babies, I have tried taking a whip to create space with him and he rears. Other than giving, uh, getting him castrated ASAP, what are the next steps? One of the best things that can be done with these babies is a, is a great bachelor herd. So I love, I love to let a herd do this. So if the mom is, is really a, a good dynamic mama, she will actually start engaging this more. But if the baby's allowed to crawl on the mama, this makes it a much more challenging um, conversation for you because she's not supporting. So if you can find a herd when he's weaned that allows the kind of conversation where they're learning social skills, I much more prefer this because if he's handleable and you can handle him, so if he got hurt, you could still handle him. So all those pieces are done. Um, I would encourage you to find a, a place where he could just be out in a herd and, you know, a, a kind herd that, but, but one that's going to teach a lot of those horse skills. And then what you do is you step in in that. So that's the best, most non-confrontational way that you will be able to define this. If he's already learning that he can rear up and he's already learning that he can engage a human that way, sending him out in the herd for a summer would be the best thing you could do. Obviously we could have conversations about, you know, making sure your space is clear and, and really I want to get to a place where you can, you know, you can be safe, but these spots can be risky. And my, so my recommendation here is try to find a really great herd that you can, can wean him into that he can have a summer just learning social skills. All right, Leona. Hi, Leona. Leona says, do you have any suggestions for training in a pasture where there isn't really any uh, level ground? He is so much better in an arena where the footing is softer and the surface is level. Uh, when we are in the pasture doing up and down hills, we struggle to find a rhythm. This is just going to be a challenge because of that. Um, that's more, you know, it's more like uh, pasture riding, you know, where you're trying to kind of get into a rhythm, but you have to kind of just find your ground. So when you say that he struggles, are you saying that he struggles to find a rhythm or that he actually gets worried? Those would be, those would be differences. Um, yeah, so just if you can respond to that one, I'll try to stay focused. Uh, he seems to get worried. Okay, so, okay, very good. Now, this is then um, an issue of him feeling like he's gonna lose his balance. So the one thing I wanna say is just make sure you're doing your best to stay very centered as he's going through it so he doesn't have to worry about you. A lot of times when horses are going up and down hills, we're actually, you know, we have a tendency to move too much and then the horse is actually thinking about their footing and tightening because of us. So number one, make sure you're staying as grounded as possible. Number two, what I would do is I would actually do a little bit of groundwork through it and just let him work at tracking through it. I know this just seems like a, um, an awkward kind of thing, but the biggest piece is, is that he has the opportunity to work at finding himself and finding his balance through that type of terrain. The next thing is, is make sure that you're not picking him up too much. When it comes to ground, what you wanna do is in your arena work, you want to make sure you are showing him how to be balanced. And in your riding out work, you wanna set it up so that he's actually taking care of it himself. So give him his head, let him work through it, and you wanna to look to see him navigating the ground and thinking about the ground and not thinking about you. So that oftentimes is where some of that anxiety comes. Awesome. So hopefully that makes sense. And then what you do is when you can and you're on ground that's not maybe as up and down, you put a little bit of leg on and ask him to soften. So you are saying, when you feel pressure, soften. So you're working his state of mind, but then try to get out of his way as much as you can. 
That's a great question. Hopefully that makes sense, Leona. All right, where am I? Okay, so uh, this next question uh, is, my horse was tacked up and ridden in my absence and the girth strap was far too tight. Um, now, uh, Siora is maybe the name, is fearful of, Siori, is fearful of the girth strap. Could I get her over this by using the same method as retraining that of the saddle? Well done. Great thinking. So again, this is, remember guys, this, the, the simplicity of a horse's mind. And when I say simplicity, I do not mean dumb. The simplicity of a horse's mind is, is really it's about how can I control pressure? So recognize anytime you're working with a horse, that's the first thing they need to know. How do I control this pressure? Are they controlling it? And usually you have a couple options. They either run, okay, they can fight. That's, that can happen too. They can think, they can think about what you're saying. They can find a way to think through it. And then there is internal yield. All right, so what you wanna do is you wanna be able to help them answer the pressure Cinching, you know, a lot of times uh, cinching problems can come just because someone tightened it too fast and too hard and then they kind of pinch them or maybe the ring, you know, bit into their hair or, you know, then now they've got a, a negative box built around that. So what I do is, and this is really what I do with my Colts when I'm getting them started, I'm going to tighten the cinch a bit. And then as I tighten the cinch, I want to ask them to soften and then release the cinch when they do. And I will do that, you know, and I'll do that two or three times so they learn that they're going to get a relief when they soften. And pretty soon again, what happens, and this usually takes, you know, five or six times, they recognize, oh, it's not even that big a deal. So then they don't feel like they have to control it every single time in a negative way. So you're just trying to redefine their way of thinking about that pressure in a way that focuses on yield. So this has a mind element because they're thinking about the, the, they're thinking about the cinch but you, it also has a pressure element. So you wanna see that their mind is calm and relaxed, and you also wanna know that they're in a thinking to pressure mind. So great on you for connecting the, the dots between the saddling and the cinching, because that's actually a very progressive conversation. So you would take your saddle through that progression, and then as you're doing your cinching, you would just be checking. So for most horses, you know, you're not doing much there, but I am checking in on them every once in a while because I don't want these kind of things to sneak up on me. Horses that have been somewhat sacked out, and that means that you keep putting a pressure in and out, in and out, or just leave it there, and they have to figure it out, they tend to go inside themselves. So they're maybe handling it, but they're doing it inside themselves. And it doesn't necessarily mean they're okay. So these kind of things can sneak up on us. So the way I avoid that is I'm gonna present a pressure, ask them to soften, take it away, until they're okay with it, then I will keep it on their body. So it's almost like you're always getting their, um, their okay, and pretty soon they start trusting you. you start, they start trusting that you're not doing anything negative and then pretty soon they can handle bigger pressures. But if they're not able to, or they tip into negativity too quick, it's really important to retrain that through the understanding of pressure and release. All right, Caitlin says, I have a huge problem with my mare. She is, uh, she's a reigning competitor and has never been in a herd or really had a home till now, wow. Um, she is having a hard time on trail rides, just me and her, about leaving the herd. Um, she backs up, turns around, takes off, and honestly, anything to go back. How can I get her to feel my grounding of calm and allow her to take her mind off the herd and into the space with me? Wow. Man, these, are, these can be challenging situations because this is, this is it. So on one hand, she has social desire, and if she hasn't been with the herd for a long time, now she's really wanting to be with the herd. So this can be a challenge. So you have some work to go. Okay, you have some work to go. Now I have um, a, a YouTube um, video on a herd bound horse or a horse that I worked in the round pen. So this is going to be number one. I want you to turn her loose in a round pen. And what I want is I want you to be able to allow or, or a pen. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to be round. And you don't need a flag. But the idea is, is that what I want you to do is I want you to get to a place where she chooses you mentally. Right now, her desire to be in the herd is stronger than her belief of how things are going to work out with the human involvement. So sometimes, depending on the training style, that, that this will, you know, help a horse either want to be with humans more or not. 
So when you're in this position, the first thing I want you to do is, so, so now just take steps way back from where you were. Turn her loose. She's going to go to the fence. She's going to mentally want to be over somewhere else. And all I want you to do is just gently apply a little pressure. Not big. You're not trying to chase her. You're not trying to get her to move her feet. And I want you to watch her eyes. Okay, the reason she's, as you said, um, backing up, turning around, taking off, anything to get back, it's because her mind is with her buddies and you're taking the body away. And all that does is cause that type of anxiety and slowly it becomes worse and worse because we're not actually answering her problem or satisfying her need. We're just breaking her apart. Okay, in the round pen, see her mind. See her mind with her buddies. Take a little pressure, apply a little pressure until you see her thought come back to you. I don't care how long. That's where your release is. She must understand, number one, that you have her best intentions in mind. And when her mind comes to you, that's the moment where she can feel your calmness. If her mind is with her buddies, you could be the most calm yogi on the planet and they would never even know it because they weren't even paying attention. Okay, it's like, you know, we've had conversations like this with people when they're not involved in the conversation and we're trying to explain something and they don't hear it. So that's number one. Then what I want you to do is, is this can be actually pretty fun, is number two, then you get on the horse in that pen and without using a whole bunch of rain, I want you to see if you can actually touch your rein or apply a little pressure and start working her mind instead of trying to ride her physical body. The goal would be is to get her to a place and first you would wanna get a nice change in the groundwork before you went to the saddle. That's gonna be hugely important. And then get to a place where you can actually direct that. Okay, so then pretty soon you, you know you can touch your aids, your leg or your rein, and they'll change their thought and that will bring them into a calm state. And that's where you end for the day. Now, if you can set this up, the best thing that you would be able to do is, A, if you wanted to go for a ride, try to go for a ride with somebody. Don't start every day where you're always pulling her away from her buddies because this can just create a bad uh, thought progression where now she's thinking about that all the time. And that's not helpful either. So go out with a buddy if you can. And then the next piece is, is go to wherever. So let's say you get on her at the barn and it depends on how handy you are. Cause some of these things are dependent upon that. If you feel a little bit inconfident, then you would pick up a whatever rain you needed and stay in a pen that you could get this job done. Um, but if you could do it is that as you're leaving the yard, now you need to, what I would encourage first is take her on the line, apply a little pressure, see her, bring her thought back, relax, and then actually take her back to her buddies. I know this sounds so contrary, but what we're doing is we're saying, if you can change your thought a little bit, I'll give you what you want. If you can change your thought and spend a bit of time with me, I'll give you what you want. Okay. And then slowly you start extending that. So don't go very far from her buddies because you're going to see this. You're recognizing when she's turning and, and wanting to take off, but way before that, she's actually mentally starting to draw to her friends. And recognize the mind will always be drawing to her friends long before she actually started to get big. The key to great horsemanship is to catch those little pieces. All right, so then you work her in hand until you can take her for a walk and you can draw her thought back, no problems. When you find the point where her mind's leaving, that's where you need to spend time. And then slowly you wanna try that in the riding. But for a period of time, let her learn you're not gonna handle her the way she expects and work her mind alone, okay? Work her mind alone until you can take her thought with you. I do not work the body to get the mind. I try to connect my aids to what the thought is doing. So if the thought is over here, I'm gonna connect my rein and I'm gonna wait until I feel the thought and then I'm gonna release. If you can direct the mind, the body is easy, okay? Anywhere you can take a thought, the body will go. And you experience this because the, the brain is still at, the, at their buddies. If you let go of those reins, be a very straight line right back to the pen. The goal is, is for you to be able to change that thought, direct it, and take it where you would like. Great, great question. Um, so yes, uh, Susan was just referencing, Caitlin that, uh, Caitlin, that there is a good video to show some of me working on that in the round pen, so you could reference that. And also on my website, there's lots of stuff there. Okay, so Deanna says, this question is from Sandy. When I go to get my mare from the field, um, she will not let me get close enough to put the halter on her. She takes off or hides behind the other horses in the pasture. What can I do? That's a great question. So a couple things that we can do. Um, first of all, these things happen in, in these patterns. It's kind of like we get, you know, maybe there was some times where she was unsure and then 
then she started kind of falling into a pattern and now we're stuck in that pattern. I really, again, I would reference my round pen video just as a starting place. And again, we're not, we're not trying to chase them or run them, but you, you want to get her to understand that when you can direct her thought that you can get the most change. Okay. So first off by herself in the round pen, you work with a little bit of pressure until you can see her thought come. Once you can get a general idea of that, what I will actually have you do is bring one of the other horses in. And what you're going to try to do is, is you're just going to keep working the thought because when it's a big pen, we're, we're kind of risking having to be as fast as a horse to, you know, if they run to the other side of the pen while they're getting their own relief. So I, I encourage people to start this in a size of pen that you can manage. So whether it's a round pen or a smaller pen that, that the horses can't necessarily, you know, succeed at this. Okay, so then what I do is, is I'm, I'm going to do one of two things. First, as she's moving, especially if you've already done a little bit of work and you have a base, you just gently start to apply a pressure. And when she walks away, you just let her. But you just keep a little pressure on. You keep a little pressure on. And when she goes to her buddies, you just keep a little pressure on. What happens pretty soon is the buddy that's there is soon going to start getting bothered with her because they're because she's bringing that pressure to them and I see it all the time it's actually quite hilarious because the other horse is kind of like get out of here so then the other horse will start supporting you pretty soon when her eye turns to you or she looks to you you just stop and walk away then you re-engage and as soon as you get her eyes you walk away remember the principle that a horse's feet will follow their thought and soon her mind will turn towards you and then as you walk to the side she'll turn and walk towards you but the idea is, is you have to let the other horses start helping you. So if we're trying to just be really quiet and do the best we can, it doesn't always get the change. So you wanna keep a little pressure on, help her change her thought. And again, I would reference that YouTube video and see if you can get that going with her. So she understands she can deal with the pressure in a different way and then bring your other horses in until you can do this. I actually, when I trained for the public, I would do this with every new horse and it was how I integrated the herd. So I would get to where I would work one horse at a time, then two horses and three horses until I had five or six horses in the round pen and you could work any one that you wanted. It's a really great way of integrating herds as well. Great question. All right. Okay, so now this is a, a compliment to the question that was asked um, about the mare who was wanting to get home or wanting to rush home. And the, the answer was um, when uh Siori is in the round pen she lunges easily when we are in the arena or paddock she won't walk forward no matter how I position my body or whip okay so now what we're doing is we're actually starting to recognize where she's kind of broke you might say broken what I mean broke is that she knows exactly what she's supposed to do but she's not super happy about it okay I apply a pressure to move forward with my body language energy increase and whip as an aid but um, dis, uh, but detest advice, uh, but the best advice I've had to put my, uh, okay, sorry, I'm just trying to follow here, um, is to put crazy pressure on her or hit her with a whip. I refuse, good for you. Our local trainer can get her to move forward, but has trained her with undue pressure, yes. With me, Siori just moves her hind end away, but uh, from me and keeps facing me. I end up laughing in frustration and we move on to something else. This can't be good. Any idea of what I'm doing wrong with, without seeing us in action? Yes. Um, okay. So number one, I would say that um, she's just anticipating a bunch of pressure. So right away, there's a bad taste in her mouth. Most of the time when people are saying pressure, 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 this is a mind frame. And the belief is, is that when a horse isn't doing what you want, you need to not let them get away with that. It's a more, what I call emotional horsemanship. Um, and it's that you can't let them get away with stuff. You're going to teach them bad things and you have to make them listen. Relational horsemanship says that if a horse is struggling, it's really about needs. She sounds to me like um, mares, mares can be like this too. They're so sensitive. They're so soft minded and people see them as, you know, um, there's lots of words for mares, but uh but they, they really care about understanding and having a good connection. And humans are honestly so, we are so unclear spatially, uh, whether that be our, the alignment or the energy we give off, because most of us are, are not letting anyone feel us. And that comes from a lifestyle of, you know, trauma and brokenness and 
getting hurt and whatever. So horses don't feel us very well. And then when all of a sudden pressure comes out, you know, they're, they're just trying to figure it out. Okay, so two things that I would say here. So good on you. I want to just use this as a bit of a, a launching pad for a bit of a soapbox. But trust your stinking heart. Okay, I truly believe we did not get into horses to have another dysfunctional relationship. We love the depth of what horses provide, the energy and the relationship we can have with them. But what happens is, is that we have actually, there's two kind of trains of thought with horses. And a lot of, you know, we can have it as an emotional thing. Everything the horse does, we interpret emotionally and we get after them. But you already know this, that that's not answering something. Something's not right. So I just want to say to everybody in your process, in your learning, if you're getting these red flags about ideas that are coming up and ways you're being encouraged to handle a horse, trust this. You might not have the experience that that person has, but every one of us has been built and created with a desire for a good relationship. Relational horsemanship premises itself on that base. Okay, that doesn't mean we don't pressure and we don't ask horses things, but it can't come out of emotionally charged negatives. All right. So, so I just wanted to encourage that in you. So now we have to figure out, okay, now how do we fix it? So recognizing when you're asking her to go forward, there's usually two things. A lot of times what people are doing is they're trying to actually apply all their energy to the hindquarters. So when she's flipping her hindquarters away, she very well could be feeling that the alignment of your energy is actually sending her hip away. So usually what I encourage is that I would actually encourage you to actually see that you turn your energy a little bit more towards her nose and shoulders. If you get too far with the alignment of your energy, you're going to feel like she's going to turn her nose into the fence. If you get too far back, the horse is going to turn around. They'll turn their hip away from their shoulders. If you find the sweet spot in the middle, they'll usually go forward. Now, let's say she doesn't. What I would encourage you to do is I would actually start the circle by leading her and then slowly sending her out on the circle when you have movement. So it gets you away from that confrontation. Just because a horse is struggling doesn't mean you have to make them get it. You need to rebuild yourself with this mare. And really, I would encourage you to just slow it down, take your time. Uh, you're already sensing the relationship you're trying to develop. And I think you need time to develop that connection with her. You might slow down some of the things you're doing, but I truly feel like this is a situation where your base needs to be rebuilt based on your heart's desire for this relationship. So if that makes sense, I, I don't know if I'm necessarily helping, but I already feel like you're on the edge of feeling this way. It's now just a matter of making sure the people you're working with are in deep alignment with your relationships that you're seeking with your horse. All right, hopefully that made sense. Um, okay, you're exactly right about what the other trainer has told me to be hard on her. It feels so wrong. Yes, please follow this. Remember, everyone is speaking from their belief system and there are vastly different beliefs about horses. For me, I feel like when horses are struggling, there's an unmet need. It's now my job to meet their need. An emotional style or a more reactive style would say when the horse is struggling, they're trying to be bad or get away with stuff. And to me, that is not acceptable. That is not the deal. So I want to try to set it up so that I'm asking questions to meet needs and not get caught up in emotional interpretations. How many of you have clear energy when you're emotional? Nobody. Okay. We, we usually use way too much pressure. We're very unclear and we're supposed to be the ones leading or directing. But I'll tell you what, when it's about meeting needs, and it's my job to step in there and help, man, I'm going to do, I'm going to, my intention is deep and sound and I'm, I'm calm. You see, so, so how you look at things really matters. All right, very good. So trust your intentions, trust your feel, and then slow things down a little bit and try to just work on the basis of mind, space, and pressure. Again, some of this to get more thoroughly into it, you know, I would recommend my website because I have been spending three years of producing online um, footage through webinars and explanations to, to kind of draw these things out. But there's also stuff on YouTube and I have some blogs on the website as well. So you can reference any of those. All right. Okay. So I'm going to um, answer Tamara's question. And I think there was a little bit more input there. So, okay. So Tamara says regarding introducing two horses in a round pen, to start this, are you saying you would put both in the pen and pick one and work on having them catch you without much focus on the other horse, then work on the second horse catching you? Okay, so yeah, what I do is I start with one horse at a time. I will not take that second horse, I will not work the second horse at first. 
Um, and But what I would encourage is, I would encourage just get that one horse hooked on just like that YouTube video. So that's, a, that's free to anybody can watch that one that really describes the mind work and get them to a place where you see them mentally hook on. They have, the, see this is the thing guys, the horses have to choose you. Relational horsemanship premises itself. I do not force my horses to do stuff. I want to set it up so they just see the qualities in me. They feel how calm I am. They see that I'm relaxed. I help them understand. And when they get those things, guys, it changes their view. Leadership is about being something that another creature desires. Dominance doesn't take that into consideration at all. Dominance says, I'm just going to do whatever will make you do what I want. So there's a lot of, of uh, differentiation here. Leadership will inspire you. Dominance will make you feel icky. You won't want to be in that relationship. So I really want to encourage everybody here. It's okay for you to have a stand for the relationships you want, even if the information you're getting is not necessarily following that. Now, if who you're working with is guiding that and makes you feel excited, then go for it. Stay there and, and just keep going. But if it's not, trust your hearts. Okay, relocate where you're getting your info until you feel so good about that information. Very, very important. Again, I said this earlier, but we didn't get into horses to um, have another unhealthy relationship. We want to we wanna deepen those relationships and have fun with our horses and learning. All right. Okay, so I'm going to um, ask another question or I have another question here that was submitted earlier. So thank you guys. Everybody's asking great questions. So this question was about riding a horse and, and about pushing through the reins. So a lot of times this is very common and, and regarding the bidding question that was asked earlier, I get this all the time. It's like, you know, people want to increase the bit because they're losing control. So you have a horse that wants to push forward. So, so in my work, when a horse is kind of out of control, we actually don't go up in pressure. We actually go down. I know that sounds crazy and it seems kind of like a contradiction, but it's not if you start thinking about why the horse is doing what they're doing. Most of the time, the reason the horse is getting bigger is because they have come to the belief that they have to take care of their own needs because you're not. And now they are getting to a place where they're fleeing the conversation. All right, so what I wanna do here is, is I'm saying, whoa, stop the boat. Truly making some confusing connections here. Let's back up and let's talk about a pillar, okay? So that would reference this whole progression that we have been watching all week. When you connect with your rein, what does that mean to the horse? When you, can you draw their thought? Can you meet their needs? Okay, and these become the pillars of this work. Once your horse understands that they don't have to run from pressure, they don't have to fear it, that they can soften and think, you see, you can really start seeing why the base of relational horsemanship is built the way it is because um, relational horsemanship isn't a quick fix deal. I'm not saying you have this problem, here's the answer. What I'm saying is when you have a problem, it should lead you back to a piece of your base that was built poorly. And so then that's really what I hope for everyone is that you can hear, oh yeah, I can see that I have this problem. Wow, that's a mind issue. Or wow, I have this problem, that's more of a space issue. Or my horse is spooking all the time. Well, that might be a pressure issue. And when you can take a step back and you can redefine those pillars, it will change so much of the relationship. So that's really what I'm trying to encourage here. All right, so we have a horse that wants to run through the reins. First thing that I want to do is back up. Start to get on the ground, make the headgear simpler, do not get more complex, because we want to make it a, a, a singular, thinkable question. Okay, not a complex, overwhelming idea. And can you get the horse to soften? When I connect with the rein, can I get the horse to soften? That is number one. Whether it's a bridle rein or a, or a halter or a side pull or a cavison, the question is when you touch the rein, can you feel an internal release in your horses? Remember guys, horses are very pure. When they have an anxious thought, that will show up as tension in their body. This is the beauty in my mind of relational horsemanship is because we're not trying to put a horse into frame. And we believe that when a horse softens, they start to give their body. And that's how we can then shape their physical body when they give us, they give it to us instead of us trying to take it. All right, so then slowly we start working back up. So you take a simple head stall, whether it's a side pull or a snaffle or something, you know, straightforward to the horse and you pick the reins up, can they soften? And can they soften all the way through? 
when they start to soften and you can get a change all the way through and you sense that they are not storing tension in their bodies, you start recognizing that it was just a need in the first place. The horse wasn't trying to run away. They were only believing they needed to preserve themselves. So if you can be the one who preserves them, they don't have to do it. And I will tell you this, I have been working horses very steady since I was 14. And I've been teaching now since I was 20. So that's going on 20 years. Um, I have seen very few horses that when you didn't just meet their needs, that most of your problems just start to diminish. And we know how that is for ourselves. When we're in relationships where we feel our needs are met, it's amazing what doesn't matter. But when you're in a relationship when your needs are not being taken care of, oh my goodness, everything bugs you. Everything irritates you and pushes you until you know, you're giving shoe placement lessons because people keep putting their shoes out of place. You know, it's like we get so bothered by all these little things. And the horses can do the same thing. Okay, so I hope that that was clear. That's a really, really important piece. But, and again, we're talking in so many ways about all of these little pieces that are not necessarily about getting bigger, okay? Emotional horsemanship, again, would be saying that the horse is doing this to get away with something. And then you would feel justified with your pressure. But I am guaranteeing it to you. How do you know if that information is being given in a way that's making you, you, making you go that direction? You will feel it in your guts. Relational horsemanship's premise says that when you meet a relational need, you will feel good inside your heart. It will not be something you're trying to swallow and just bear with, okay? And that is the beautiful connection that we can trust with our horses to say, man, this feels good. This, this speaks to who I am. And every one of you will do it a little bit different. And that's cool. I'm not here to contradict some and, and bring up others. What I'm just trying to say is follow your heart and find your home in all that you're trying to do with your horses. It's really great. Okay. Um, now, this was another one. Um, so there was an observation in my third demo where we talked about, um, I, I did everything in the bridle. So all the in-hand work was done in the bridle. So this speaks a little bit to the complimentary question of a horse pushing through the bridle. And the question was, should I start in my bridle? If your horse is totally cool about the bridle and you have the ability to move the shoulders, sure. But if you find when you touch that bridle rein, and this was the issue that Dana had in that lesson, in my third demo, that when she touched the rein, the horse would immediately take her head and push her shoulder. So it's in those moments I would encourage going to a side pole or a cavison. That would be even the best. Again, I've said this many times. I believe the cavison is one of the most valuable groundwork uh, tools that you can have because it's always rotating the pole. When you pull here on a halter, you're actually turning the head the wrong way. So, so I don't do any groundwork really in a, in a halter or put a pole on a halter because I want to rotate the pole into the bend instead of counter flex the pole. So this in itself can be one of the big reasons why we're getting some of these effects because the gear is contradicting the thing we're actually wanting it to do. So get it very simply, use something simple to create the flow and the motion and then add the bridle. So in that lesson with Dana, if she wasn't able to get it, and I would say that she did, she made some really nice changes and was able to get the shoulders and feel the mare bend, then there's no problem to stay in the bridle. If you're finding that you feel like you're just bumping up against a wall and your horse is not able to think about the changes, then I encourage you to slow it down, take a step back, okay? There's such relief in this, I find, when you're given permission to say, you don't have to push your way through it. You don't have to make your horse, you know, force your horse, because I don't believe, and I don't care, you know, and this is one of the things I stand pretty strong on. I do not believe horses are trying to get away with things. I don't believe they're trying to be bad. They do not have the same uh, human elements of, of that type of dynamic. They are entirely trying to get by. They just want to live. And whatever deal provides that best, the horse will buy that line. So I've had horses in clinics and, you know, the, the horse is really struggling and I spend a couple minutes with them and they really start to make a change and they really start to enjoy my presence. And, and the reason is, is because they're just so desperately wanting to have a good deal. So that really works for us. So there was a, um, a comment earlier where we were kind of talking about, you know, uh, I can't remember who it was, but they were talking about trying to be calm. But even when they were staying calm, nothing was working. Calmness is a huge thing, but you have to have the horse paying attention to that first. So the more you can have what you want the horse to be in yourself and feel that you're giving that off, then as you answer those needs, oh my goodness, you become a very appealing presence. 
And for me, that's really what I'm trying to do in my horses. And I've said this many times is I want to be what I want the horse to feel. Okay. And the, what's going on you is the best that can be happening in them. And that really does put a lot of responsibility. A lot of people make their decisions on me based on that premise. They would just like to make the horse do the thing and not have to make a change within them. And really that that's a big deal to me. I want everyone to recognize that's why we have to be doing our own, our own work within ourselves so that we're offering a better deal to both people and horses. So I think on that note, I am going to wrap up. This has been great. I know it's a bit of a horse race because I'm trying my best to answer as many questions as I can. Um, I hope that was helpful. This is going to be recorded and it is recorded and is going to be on YouTube so that you guys can come back to it. In my own work, you know, we were, we did all of this. This was all stuff initially I was going to just put on my website. Uh, but just with everything that's going on, it felt like it was important to be able to share with, with more people and connect with you guys in this crazy time when everybody's seemingly sitting around and not having a lot to do. So I hope that this was helpful to you all. I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, for more reference work, guys, from the, from the free side of things, you can see stuff on my YouTube page. We have a blog that you can uh, connect with. We send newsletters out with training tips and whatnot. And then I have my membership site where people can sign up on whatever level they want if you're interested. But the point of all this right now is just to create connection in the community. You can join me on Facebook as well. Um, and yeah, we just, the community on Facebook, my Facebook group is just all about trying to deepen the community and support each other on this crazy journey we're all on. So thank you very much, guys, for joining me on this. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing many of you in the future. And if you need more help, just stay in touch. And we'll do what we can to assist you on this journey. Bye for now, guys.